Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Prayer Some Day. Somebody asked me last week, is Prayer Some Day, the 12th of December, <clears throat> the day on which Pretum was enlightened? I don't know. I think it was his passport birthday. Uh, but if somebody knows, perhaps they'll fill me in on that. <clears throat> the title of today's talk is What Is? This means what existence actually is. It also means answer the question, what is isness or pure consciousness? I'll add to that, we can lead ourselves to perceiving it. That's a question, but we can. So let's get into the how. For newer meditators in particular, or if you don't comprehend the whole jigsaw of the universal teachings, we need to throw in viewpoints from different angles to make it simpler. With satsangs, it needs to be truth, of course. It's always truth that leads to truth. <clears throat> In our case, unraveling the dilemma of not being able to realize whole truth. And we want to be capable of passing on the truth, the pure teachings, to others if we get involved as teachers. This is vitally important as I see it, because the newer and younger students will soon be carrying Pretum's message forward on their own. <clears throat> Not all meditators will want to achieve liberation or self-realization as we call it, but the nub of the teachings we're promoting is liberation. So it is always to be prioritized. For those who prefer attachment right now, after meditating for some time, the mind usually picks up on the sense of the pointlessness of this illusion and that there's a satisfactory alternative here within our grasp. To me, I set a priority years ago to recognize that the teachings are far and away more critical than the techniques. Techniques are easy to understand and we can tweak them to our own satisfaction. But we've been attracted to yoga in the first place to bring our inner self to a commanding position over our outer self. The techniques start us off and help us to build fearlessness and the strength to change our perspective, which we know is essential in eliminating the confusion we have, as well as eliminating suffering for the individual. I'll just inject here, if you don't know how the word suffering translates into what we're doing in our lives, take a look at the four Buddhist seals. Lion's Roar on the internet is a good place to find it. Lion's Roar. The foremost question truth seekers have is why are we in illusory bondage acting as if this is real we're in a spiral leading to nowhere because what we see around us seems to prevent us from knowing what actually is so let's look at what we really are 
I like to quote Einstein because he's so well known. He stated the truth of what we are in three very precise sentences. He said, it's all just energy and that's all. Match the frequency of the reality you want and you can't help but get that reality. Hang on to this word frequency. It's not philosophy, it's physics. We'll look at the physics in a moment to see if this can help us. Firstly, we're told we do know what is already. Our whole consciousness knows it. But we're shielding it from view. We repeat this unendingly as a fact we've learned. But we need to translate it into experientiable knowledge. Remember, Pritam repeatedly said it is experientiable. It needn't remain just a theory. As I'll try to show you in a moment, I am not here speaking to you and you are not here listening to me because it's all an illusion. But it looks like there's something here, doesn't it? And we definitely have the impression there's a me who has things. So can we solve this puzzle by finding a missing link? We're told by the masters our misinterpretation of what is, is the cause of our suffering. And that's correct, because we interpret it with a mind that can never know it. So how do we interpret correctly in a way that will clear the confusion? I personally think there is a missing link for bringing us quickly to realization. Pretum asked us to employ absoluteness in our outlook. What's that? In Pretum's first talk, he appealed to us to employ absoluteness, to fire our efforts straight to the target of where we want to be, full consciousness. Putting it into context here, meditation is a tool we need. Mindfulness, which is awareness of what is here and now, is the sharpening process. It sharpens the tool. And absoluteness moves us on from these practices, which shouldn't be dropped, of course, to appreciation of our greater consciousness. Pretum used the analogy of the London to Manchester motorway to take the straight road instead of the back lanes. Mindfulness is the back roads. Once we've driven them and get to know there's a motorway, get out there and use it. Absoluteness is a commitment to bringing in truer perspective in every waking moment if we can, and not just now and then. And we all know Pretum lamented he was blue with us sometimes for not going a bit faster, he said, to get to the prize of self-realization. I got a strong feeling he was saying, why haven't you employed absoluteness sufficiently? Haven't given it your all. Without the commitment to firing straight at the target, we're going to fall short of realization just now. In many instances, 
we truth seekers may not be quite ready to merge into pure consciousness. But our candle is lit, and according to Priyatam, because we're a light, we can do it this lifetime. Nobody's excluded in this. We lit the candle of truth ourselves. Everybody does. Nobody does it for them. And similarly, everyone can find enlightenment. Now, if the missing link is performing more absoluteness, I also feel the seamlessness of the link is removing a blockage we inadvertently erect. I found for myself, we sometimes look for a formula that doesn't exist. We imagine we want to transform, traveling from here to there, from attachment and lack of the right ammunition to a state of all knowledge. But there's nowhere to reach, no moving along a path. There's no me to whom we can direct instructions. All that is imagination. But what we're after is closer to us than our skin. I use a more appropriate formula now of just four words. Stop denying your self. It's much more direct to the target. As another personal aid, I now also use the word truthing in relation to my effort to overcome denial of what really is, what I really am. I find truthing as a word sounds more inviting and more achievable than conscious effort or unconditioning, which are the words we've always used and which mount to the same thing in principle. What, what I say to myself all day is drop seeking and get on with truthing. It gets me into action. I'm not telling others they should do this, just sharing what could be shortcuts. I'm still teaching myself the way home. I've come the long route and perhaps sharing experiences can shorten the route for others. Who knows? Shortcuts brings me to my next tip. I found for myself I get more effective access to where I want to go by following another of Priyatam's distinct directives. Become your own guru. Obviously, we need constant remembrance at all times as a reference to what the enlightened ones say. But I think being our own guru enables us because we learn faster. And when we ask ourselves to answer questions, it's a better focus. In effect, we deliberate on what we know already and quickly turn towards enlightened teachings to correct any mistakes we make or lack of understanding. It's a winning formula in my view. If you say, I couldn't do that, think that it's simply a case of allowing ourselves to be our own guru and not judging I don't know enough. Now the physics lesson, I've brought some equipment with me. <laughs> the construction of everything, the physics, helps us in the constant war with the mind. 
I found looking at the physics in an exceedingly simple way, which everybody can do, can be incomparably helpful in appreciating we are energy and not solid matter. I find this solves misconceptions regarding the illusion in a far more direct way than anything else. First, I'll recap quickly on quantum discoveries, which prove we are no thing. Modern microscopes show us we are just energy. Even the smallest particles known today, the up quarks and the down quarks, are shown to be 99.999% nothing. And the other 0.00001% is a proton flying around a neutron, neither of which are solid either, but simply movements of energy. Einstein was correct. Guraj was correct too. In the same way, he stated, everything is one essence and it just coagulates in different ways. Since 2012, we fortunately have proof that the Higgs boson is invisibly behind all this, making matter which is flying electrons, look like mass. I remember Priatum predicting this, but he didn't know Higgs. He knew most other people, didn't he? And he called it the Shitron. I called them four ways in little diagrams in Discover Your Subtle Self. The Higgs particle is the most amazing discovery ever, but it hasn't hit home yet. It's four dimensional particles that are electrically neutral. Not that that means anything to you probably, but the flying electrons we have in this field get caught in them. Then the heat and light energy which electrons are affected by, cause them to put up resistance. I'll get my first object now, physics, physics lesson this is. If you turn down the light here and the heat, this disappears. At minus 200 and something degrees C, I can put my hand straight through this and this and all this, everything. So it's only temperature and light causing this all to appear solid. This literally means solid objects are all holograms displaying a resistance to temperature. I should repeat this sentence over and over again, which I do to myself every day. In truthing, I recognize this truth first. We are holograms, not real people. Let's get even simpler now by looking at the second and first dimensions instead of the third and fourth. This is my third dimensional object. It has width and height and depth, three dimensions. If I take one surface, we call that two dimensions, just the width and the height. If I try to get to that two dimensional piece, I've got to go finer than I possibly can to achieve it. 
however fine I can scrape that surface off, it's still three dimensional because it has thickness. If I get to what I think is two dimensions, it's nothing. The same applies to my one dimensional stick. This obviously has thickness, but we think of one dimension as a straight line or just one of these. But by looking at the one, two and three dimensional objects, we can see one dimension is an imagination on this square. It needs another dimension for it to exist. It doesn't exist on its own. It's now possible to imagine two dimensional square is there, but it's not there as I've just demonstrated if the whole cube isn't there. Again, it's an imagination. Now, the three dimensional cube, this could be you, me, or a mountain or a bus, is only possible, we know now, because of the Higgs bosons in the background. That's what it means. And the Higgs boson is only possible to imagine if the next dimension, which is space time, is also there, propping it up. And so on. The fifth dimension is only imaginable if the sixth dimension is there. We, we'll be coming across non separation by then. And so on, up to what we call the 11th dimension at the moment, which in our terms would be pure consciousness. Because we should remind ourselves here that all dimensions are not spheres of reality, they're greater degrees of understanding or consciousness. Actually, actuality is the greatest amount of truth out there. And that's what we get when we get to the final all dimensions. We verified that there's no standalone dimension whatsoever until we get to this wholeness. So at best, as I've said, every dimension is an idea. Pritam used a useful analogy of us limiting our consciousness by looking at the pretty colours in one face of a diamond and acting as if that was reality. Whereas, if we stand back and allow consciousness to improve, we get reality as the whole stone, the whole diamond. One more thing about these Higgs particles. They are impossible to measure because they're in the next dimension, but they are, as we've seen, slightly more real than this. They are so many in number, they're like a thick soup, absolutely everywhere. So we could use our imagination to know that we are a thick soup in a thick soup. It's not pure consciousness, but it's the next consciousness we can expand into, open our thinking into. You might react, there's no way I want to be soup. That's the mind being frightened of truth. Think about how a two dimensional character, if you could live on that plane, would reject height because of lack of knowledge lack of allowing the understanding of a better dimension, a better consciousness. You might have read the book 
flatlands, which depicts two dimensional characters bumping into each other and refusing greater consciousness for fear of losing what they already have. If we deliberate on this, the soup, which is an imagination too, wouldn't we be, if we could perceive it in a more actual sense of being, by encompassing the consciousness of this mega particle invisibility, which would actually mean freedom from restricted edges, no resistance to movement, no ideas or attachments, no decay, no need for food, no hot or cold, and no troubled mind, of course no suffering whatsoever. Let's open our mind to that. Just a word of advice here, the mind can't align with greater reality. It can sense there's something else but doesn't have the capacity to become something more real itself the mind doesn't actually exist. But when, when you get the idea of something greater, be it in meditation or ordinary activity, just come into that quiet space and let the me be gone. Let it be what it is, encourage it, but don't get involved because that would be the mind. Isn't this an open secret that every meditator feels? It's perspective we need to change and that's all, as Pritam often said, don't bring anything else into play. The mind wants you to do this to lead you up the garden path. Truth isn't attractive to the mind. The mind thinks this will be the finish of me. Guru Raj on this one, quote, man doesn't want to accept to adapt himself to truth. So he molds the truth to suit his own needs. But by accepting the physics, we've improved our position. We've improved our consciousness. We understand more. And every little bit more consciousness, understanding counts towards liberation. Away from the restricted weirdness this mind throws up. We are in fact, by allowing greater consciousness, reactivating the energy of all possibilities, letting go of ancient thinking, which is a closed mind and has restricted us so severely. So we need to take ourselves away from restricted thinking. The more we bring in all possibilities, the closer we'll get to whole consciousness when me is replaced by real I. That's when we become totally satisfied without being a thing who has things on a holographic planet 
in a holographic universe. Advert now. Some of what I've said is in this little book. It's called Five Sattvic Keys. I don't know if you can see it. You can get it from Amazon. Just type in five, the number five, Sattvic Keys. Or you can go on the BM, BMS website, which is BritishMeditationSociety.com where there's an abridged version you can read without spending one pound 99. <laughs> I saw on Facebook last week, I go on there every couple of weeks, a clip from Sadhguru. He said, pay attention to the inner nature of who you are. you can become really meditative, not just sit silent with your eyes closed. Decide, he said, is it a fashion come pleasantness you want, or is it a real endeavor? We need to make up our minds on this one. Am I determined to shed this problematical oddity and become real? If no, it doesn't have to be yes. Then I'd advise keep meditating and keep good company until perhaps the wondrousness, the wondrous existence of just being beckons you. Pretum appealed to us, do it now. Don't leave it. You've brought yourself to the door, walk through it. These opportunities are rare. We think we've got hundreds of lifetimes, but the opportunities this time, being near this master, are rare. It's up to each of us to make the decision. Pretum used the analogy of the coin. It has two sides, two faces, and the more you align yourself with the idea that you are not the person, the more you'll choose heads instead of tails. This brings us full circle. It's exactly what Einstein said. Choose the frequency of the vibration you wish to be your reality. It is purely a choice and not a doing something to get yourself into another state. We change our perspective by heightening our vibration. which happens as soon as we let go of the worn out ancient concepts. One of which is you're just solid matter. To raise the frequency of one's vibration, we can bring in limitlessness, which means open the mind, think all possibilities, Right brain thinkers do this all the time. And a lot of us become right brain thinkers doing our meditation and learning what we are. Right brain thinkers don't believe what they've learned in terms of facts and they don't need to achieve or be like someone else. If we get used to thinking all possibilities by enlivening our right brain, we're on the road to liberation, which is simply the end of that which requires an answer. 
that is another teacher's words um i've forgotten his name at the moment but refusing to stick to traditional think thinking what we call traditional old-fashioned increases the pace at which we can let go when we do it we realize there's no such thing as a person who has things i'm ending now i sincerely hope within the guraj family everyone finds improved consciousness is improved life and it's achieved very simply by recognizing what's really going on here and refusing to restrict our thinking to that of the dark ages we're here for one reason only to improve consciousness which leads to our liberation away from the fallacious thought process the alternative is getting to the end of life thinking what was the point namaste everyone end of talk will i hear you again ramon <laughs> Hang on, I'll pull on my earphones if I can find them. I can't hear you. Oh, well. Ah, oh, have I got to... No, I'm not on mute, am I? Hang on a minute. Hang on. Let me... Um... Hmm. See if I can get put these on. No better. No, my sound has gone. Um. Thank you. Sí. Ah. Lo vamos a hacer seguido. Bueno, pues yo, siguiendo la tradición de, de, de lo que era... La, la entrada de Burras en, en la sala, eh, os propongo que hagamos uh, algún minuto de meditación. Entonces, Sergio, si, si me pones uh, la imagen de Guru Sachi. Fernando, si sí. la tienes tú, puedes ponerla para compartir pantalla. Comparto yo pantalla. Yo la tengo. La tengo puesta, pero no sé cómo compartirla, la verdad. Quizá la tiene Irma, está Irma. Ah, pero no es eh, host.
Bueno, pues supongamos que ha pasado un ángel. Es, es algo que se dice, que se dice en, en España cuando hay un minuto de silencio vacío. Eh, bueno, quería empezar con agradecimientos primero a lo que es Ramón y a la gente que ha trabajado con Ramón. A todo el equipo de Ramón, porque eh, conozco el trabajo que ha representado poner esto en marcha. Un, un momento, eh, por favor. Jiru, ¿tienes el botón para seleccionar, para ponerte en, en inglés? Porque estás en el audio de castellano. Vale. Eh, ya, ya. Eh, Ahora tenemos eh, un lugar donde vamos a, a tener recogidas las enseñanzas de Guru Ras. Giru. No, perdona, eh, Fernando, tú vas hablando y Giru lo va traduciendo en otro canal. Tú no hace falta que esperes a su, a su traducción. Vale, vale. Es que le estaba hablando. Él va hablando por su cuenta en otro audio. Vale. Tú ve a tu, a tu ritmo no muy rápido para que Giru pueda ir traduciéndote. Vale. Bueno, vamos a tener eh, recogidas en, en un sitio eh, las enseñanzas de Guru Rush. Los documentos, los vídeos, el audio, de forma que van a estar accesibles a todo el mundo, en el sentido más amplio de la palabra, es decir, a todo el planeta. Vamos a poder consultar, aprender tanto nosotros como terceras personas interesadas. Y además vamos a utilizar esta, este instrumento para que la información fluya entre todos nosotros libremente. Quería también daros las gracias a todos por vuestra asistencia. De la, mejor, de la mejor forma que sea hacerlo, que es con mi pensamiento, palabra y obra, saludo la divinidad que hay en todos nosotros. Porque todos somos hijos de Dios. Somos la manifestación del manifestador. No hay diferencia entre el manifestador y la manifestación. Solamente, únicamente, la manifestación está sobreimpuesta al manifestador. Y luego quería también, para iniciar esta charla, dedicarle un poema a mi maestro Burras, un poema que es un extracto del libro sagrado de los hindúes, del Bhagavad Gita, en su capítulo 4, y os leo el poema. Es un poema dedicado a Guru Rush. Yo soy el que nunca ha nacido y el que nunca ha muerto. Soy el Señor de todo lo que respira. Parezco que he nacido, pero es solo una apariencia, es solo mi malla, porque, aunque he nacido, yo sigo siendo el dueño de mi ser real, dueño del poder que me hace. Cuando la bondad se debilita, cuando el mal crece, yo vuelvo a nacer en un cuerpo. En todas las edades, yo vuelvo para liberar al noble, para destruir la ignorancia, para restablecer lo que es correcto. 
Conforme las personas se me acercan, así las recibo, porque todos los senderos conducen a mí. Soy el sabor del agua y del éter su sonido. Son palabras que Krishna dice a Arjuna en un determinado momento. Muchas de las palabras eh, que os voy a decir, o prácticamente todas, están copiadas de Guru Rush. Eh, las ideas que os voy a comunicar están copiadas de Guru Ras. Las he sacado de sus enseñanzas escritas o de vídeos o de escuchar audios. Yo realmente eh, no tengo idea sobre este tema, no tengo ninguna idea. Y eso no es que sea una postura eh, humilde o de no tener capacidades, sino eh, que realmente... Después de tantos años, me he dado cuenta que las enseñanzas de Guru Ras se van posando en cada uno de los meditadores durante las prácticas, durante lo que son las propias eh, eh, lecturas de sus enseñanzas, se va depositando en nosotros y constituyen una energía interior que se mueve dentro de nosotros y que no tiene nada que ver nada ni con la mente la mente racional ni con las ideas. En ese sentido yo me considero un instrumento de una energía que fluye dentro de mí. Eh, lo que sí que soy es eh, eh, muy practicante. Yo practico eh, las cosas que escucha Gurras. Por ejemplo, cuando dice, mira, tienes que confrontar el miedo de esta forma. Y lo pongo en práctica y digo, oye, pues, pues es verdad, me funciona. O cuando dice, por ejemplo, eh, eh, el esfuerzo, que es mejor esforzarse o aceptar las cosas y, y no realizar ningún esfuerzo, no luchar por lo que tú eh, quieres conseguir, pues... Urras responde la aceptación y lo pongo en práctica y me funciona. Así que lo que sí que soy, eh, en ese sentido, en el sentido radical de la palabra, es un buen practicante. Las enseñanzas de Urras se entienden mucho mejor si se practican. La verdad es que yo tengo la capacidad de, de escuchar, de ver, de leer a Guru Raj y le voy entendiendo fácilmente. Digo, ah, esto que dice Guruji es cierto. Ah, esto que dice Guruji es cierto. Pero cuando practica sus enseñanzas, las entiende mucho mejor. Por eso os animo tanto a revisar sus enseñanzas como a practicarlas. En las, en, las enseñanzas de Guru Ras eh, es fundamental la energía, la energía del propio Guru Ras. Es su gran valor añadido. Cuando nosotros estamos haciendo alguna de sus técnicas, no solamente la técnica que estamos haciendo, eh, que... A lo mejor, uh, bueno, pues eh, la técnica de la vela es una uh, técnica centenaria o milenaria que se puede hacer eh, en cualquier circunstancia, pero siempre que nos ha dado una técnica Urras y en sus enseñanzas, no solamente es la técnica, sino que con ellas va uh, su energía. Y su energía es lo más importante de todas sus enseñanzas, porque desde el momento inicial, desde que nos acercamos a, a, a conocer o a encontrarnos con Guru Rush, se pone en marcha un mecanismo por el cual el corazón va enviando mensajes, mensajes sutiles a la mente, diciéndole, chica, aquí quien manda soy yo. Y se pone en marcha, en circulación, ese mensaje que el corazón se va, se va, va a ser quien va a mandar en nuestra vida. 
de una forma sutil, de una forma eh, imperceptible, que tardamos años en darnos cuenta que eso ha ocurrido así, pero ese mecanismo existe. Y para mí es el gran valor añadido de las enseñanzas de Guru Ras. Tenemos que entrenarnos a, a, a recibir o a conocer o a sensibilizarnos a esa energía sutil o imperceptible, porque todos estamos inmersos eh, en nuestro día a día, durante las 24 horas, a esa energía imperceptible, que es la que nos va modificando y con la cual te puedes hacer amigo, puedes llegar a darte cuenta. Es lo que en el lenguaje normal llamamos casualidades y coincidencias. Pero si miramos con detalle, si miramos eh, con tranquilidad, si miramos con una lupa, esas casualidades y circunstancias nos van a revelar mucho más de esa energía intangible en la que estamos inmersos. Por eso es importante, y el libro de los Salmos, en el Antiguo Testamento, dice... Eh, permanece en quietud, permanece tranquilo y reconoce que yo soy tu Dios. Para mí es algo uh, importante que nos entrenemos en coger esas sutilezas que nos están rodeando eh, y que nos están uh, protegiendo. Otra cosa que que para mí es importante después de tantos años, es la elegancia que tienen las enseñanzas de Guru Ras, en el sentido de que son energías que se meten en tu vida, que te dan uh, mucha mayor seguridad, mucha mayor felicidad, pero uh, no te uh, molestan en las decisiones que tienes que tomar. Es un cambio sutil de perspectiva, pero por ejemplo, Uh, no te obligan a, a ser vegetariano o a no serlo. No te obligan a tener una profesión estresante o a, a retirarte, por ejemplo, a ser pastor. ¿eh? No te obligan a ser más o menos consumista. No te obligan a ver más o menos televisión. No te obligan a cambiar tus opiniones políticas. Y sin embargo, son, tienen mucho peso en tu vida. Yo le llamo a eso ser elegante. Algunas veces a mí me hubiera gustado eh, que me obligaran a hacer cosas. Porque tenía que tomar decisiones y hubiera preferido que las tomasen por mí. Pero es algo que no, que no he notado. Cuando te enfrentas a esos opuestos, por ejemplo, si merece la pena eh, eh, tener un trabajo eh, dentro de lo que es una empresa, ser el director de ventas de una empresa, o lo que realmente eh, es mucho mejor para ti es retirarte eh, al campo, pues eh, ese tipo de opuestos... Kururas lo que nos recomienda es que nos salgamos de la discusión entre qué es bueno y qué es malo y que nos elevemos por encima de esos opuestos y tengamos una perspectiva por encima de esos opuestos. De tal manera que pasemos de estar movido por de, de ser una marioneta de las circunstancias de la vida, de lo que todo el mundo opina, de lo que podemos ver en la televisión, en la radio, en los medios, Dejar de ser esa marioneta para convertirnos en el titiritero, en la persona que dirige los hilos de esa marioneta. Y al convertirnos en quien dirige los hilos de esa marioneta, nos hacemos los dueños de nuestra vida. Entonces, elevarnos sobre los opuestos y hacernos los dueños de nuestra vida. La otra cosa que os quería comentar como eh, eh, circunstancias o cosas que a mí se me, se me han ido acumulando a lo largo de tantos años de, de meditación es 
qué tiempo necesitamos para uh, que nos ocurra la apertura de corazón. Y en ese sentido, uh, Gurras dice, tú puedes regar a las plantas, pero no puedes hacerlas crecer. Es decir, estamos uh, preparando nuestro jardín para la llegada de esa apertura de corazón, pero solo preparando. La apertura de corazón llegará de forma espontánea. No depende de nuestra voluntad, con lo cual no podemos marcar los tiempos, pero sí podemos ir preparando nuestro jardín, nuestras circunstancias, para que el hecho ocurra. El que no dependa de nuestra voluntad, pues ya yo, por lo menos buscando, lo dijo San Pablo en una carta que dirigió a, a los eh, ciudadanos de Éfeso, en el que les ya comentaba, no solo por las obras tendréis la liberación. ¿Y por qué? Pues él mismo lo decía porque no nos creamos que haciendo buenas obras ¿eh? podemos uh, comprar lo que es la apertura del corazón. Entonces, todas las obras que hagamos en este mundo tienen un único destino, que es entregarlas. Nadie puede llevarse sus obras uh, cuando abandona este mundo. Y el que por apegos sea capaz uh, de llevárselas pues eh, lo siento por él porque cuando vuelvan a hacer esas mismas obras le, le patearán el trasero, como se dice. Entonces, no depende de nuestra voluntad, aunque al mismo tiempo sí depende, porque muchas veces nos negamos a esa apertura de corazón. Entonces, estamos en ese baile en el que por una parte tenemos que aportar algo, por otra parte no es suficiente y tenemos que esperar a recibirlo. Y eso es eh, lo que Gurras eh, decía, eh, tú da un paso hacia Dios y Dios dará diez pasos hacia ti. Y bueno, pues todas estas cosas de las que os he hablado, todas estas ideas que ya os digo que no son mías, y estoy encantado de que no sean mías, eh, eh, yo las aprendí de Burras, son ideas de las cuales no tenía uh, ningún conocimiento antes de encontrarme con él, y eso que lo había buscado en muchísimos sitios, en títulos universitarios de, de ciencia y tecnología, o en estudios de, de, de antropología o de filosofía o de todas logías que os podáis imaginar. Y realmente eh, fue a partir del encuentro lo que me fue refrescando eh, ideas, ideas que siempre me han parecido uh, por parte de Burras eh, perfectas, es decir, un puro equilibrio. Y bueno, pues tampoco quería alargarme mucho. Desde aquí quiero enviar mi agradecimiento a Gurras por todo lo que ha significado en mi vida. Yo estaría muerto si no lo hubiera conocido, hubiera muerto de dolor. Y con mi pensamiento, palabra y obra, doy gracias a Gurras que es mi maestro. Namaste y un beso para todos.